Okay, so the bio was designed to introduce just a bit of levity. I hope it did at least a little bit of that. Uh, <clears throat> it's true, my wife still doesn't believe that part. She keeps telling me to take that, that out there. By the way, she breezed past it really quick, but it's also true that when I talk about things today like speed, there was a little, you might have seen the medals up there. Last year I was, for the first time, a gold medal winning national champion in track and field. How cool is that? Right? <clears throat> so, so I have at least some credentials if I talk about speed. Okay, but I'm actually quite serious about what I'm here to talk to you today about, which is my professional passion, and that is helping leaders like you achieve dramatically higher levels of project portfolio performance. <clears throat> as exciting and inspiring as this topic is to me, I was shocked, shocked, to learn that not everyone sees it this way. <laughs> so I have a goal today, <clears throat> I have a promise actually I'm going to make to you, <clears throat> and that is to inspire and excite you on this topic. You think I have a chance? Yeah? yeah? <laughs> All right. Uh, <clears throat> it's okay if you want to keep your expectations low too. Okay, I'll, I'm fine with that. Uh, but you know, I thought, what if they all say, yeah, I think you have a chance. Then I need to do something better, right? I have to have a stretch goal. So I thought I'd come up with a stretch goal that's meaningful to me and hopefully is meaningful to at least some of you. And so my stretch goal <clears throat> is to help you become dramatically <clears throat> higher impact as project leaders so that you might advance humankind. Do you think I have a shot at that? <laughs> It'd be cool if it happened with just like one of you, right? We'll see. <clears throat> okay, so let's dive right into it. I figured, you know, why not start off with a high impact leadership scenario, project leadership scenario. Let's, let's call it an island rescue. If you could rescue seven people stranded on an island, would you feel like high impact project leaders? Yeah. Pretty cool, right? So <clears throat> when I think about that, I think about this. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who don't know what this is, you might be too young, this is a silly sitcom from the 60s called Gilligan's Island, and these seven characters were comically incapable of being rescued. Uh, they had a professor character who would come up with all these interesting schemes like contacting orbiting astronauts by radio. He had a radio. Uh, <clears throat> and somehow Gilligan would always mess it up. So I would, I would always try and come up with schemes to rescue them myself. Any of you do that too? Right? <clears throat> like, like Gilligan proof your scheme, right? <clears throat> to be high impact. So we were, this is innate in us, isn't it? If you're in this room, it's probably because you have a passion for this too. You've probably had it since you were a small child. For the record, I mentioned this show was in the 60s. I caught it on reruns, okay? <laughs> so, switching topics here to raise the impact slightly. Seven people's high impact, 60,000 people's higher impact, agreed? And when I thought of that number, I thought of this event in 1989, some of you may remember. For those of you who don't, <clears throat> this, uh, the Loma Prieta earthquake that year collapsed part of the San Francisco Bay Bridge toppled sections, entire sections of freeway, uh, killed some people, injured others, and, and shook the foundations of Candlestick Park. And that was game three of the World Series that you're seeing right there. That's how most of the country learned of this, by the way. They're watching that game. So we didn't hear about this because those people were evacuated from that park safely. Luckily, there was not a lot of damage to the stadium. No big deal. But imagine if this was the island, and those were the 60,000 people stranded, and it was your job to rescue them. See where I'm going? Pretty high impact now? Right, real, real people, this happens, right, to real people sometimes. <clears throat> but I thought, you know, I'm not satisfied with 60,000. Let's go even higher impact. Imagine <clears throat> almost half a million people. You're assigned to rescue almost half a million people, so eight stadiums full, from an island, safely. 
Sound pretty good? Good project? Okay. So let's say you're also students of history and you happen to know that the largest sea lift rescue ever undertaken was 1940 at Dunkirk, where 339,000 British and French soldiers were pulled from the clutches of the enemy to safety. <clears throat> they, the German army had blitzkrieged in a matter of weeks all the way across the continent to this point here, <clears throat> leaving so, such little time for the British Navy to respond with the seal of rescue that it had to call out help from civilian boats. Arguably the best Navy in the history of the world up until that time called out for help for this massive project. The high-impact project leaders that you are, however, have signed up to do 500,000 people. Unprecedented in the history of the world. Still game for this challenge? Few of you only. <clears throat> Starting to sound a little less enticing. So let's say that, uh, let's keep going with this. Let's say that there's a few additional challenges here that your project has to face that these guys did not, okay? <clears throat> Let's say, first off, uh, in your case, the island that you're trying to rescue the, your 500,000 people from has actually already been under attack. Unlike at Dunkirk, where the attack was expected imminently, yours is underway, okay? And because the attack is underway, there have been explosions and fires that have trapped your 500,000 people in one small end of the island, which creates a number of problems, among which are the number of piers your boats can dock at are severely limited. Furthermore, those explosions and fires have created all kinds of smoke and dust and debris, greatly limiting visibility. <clears throat> That means that your rescuers sometimes can't see the people they're trying to rescue. The people you're trying to rescue usually can't see you. And sometimes your own boats can't see each other. Starting to, starting to get more fun now? Okay. <clears throat> Let's keep going. Unlike at Dunkirk, where they had perfect communication with all the troops, in your case, you have a CB radio. So you can't really connect directly with anyone you're trying to rescue. In fact, even if, for the few people who can see you, they actually don't know that you're trying to rescue them. Still, still game for this challenge? Yeah. Pin drop, right? <clears throat> oh, but there's more. You see, with the explosions and fires and, and dust and debris and, and smoke, People are not only finding it hard to see, but hard to breathe. And unlike the fit, battle-ready soldiers at Dunkirk, the 500,000 you're chartered with rescuing are regular civilians, including many elderly, infirm, some confined to a wheelchair, and many injured in the explosions and fires. Starting to sound like, like a cool project? Still? No? <clears throat> Sucks. <laughs> Yeah. Starting to sound like any projects you've been on? <laughs> <clears throat> so, there's just one more thing that I'm going to ask you to seriously consider before you undertake this. Intelligence reports suggest that it's possible that the pattern of explosions and fires may have been designed by the enemy to trap your 500,000 people in that one small confined space, enabling phase two of the attack, which could be to launch chemical and biological weapons. Which, of course, if you expose your rescue teams to, could kill them. And you're on the boat. <clears throat> now it's getting real, right? Okay, so you might be wondering, this was maybe kind of fun, but why the ridiculously impossible scenario, right? <clears throat> well, would you believe that this ridiculously impossible scenario is real? It actually happened. Let's watch. So who wants to see how these project leaders did? 
with this challenge. Let's cue it up, guys. Did you hear that last line? I'm actually going to go back to a slide real quickly to give you a sense of that difference between nine days and nine hours. <clears throat> if you do the throughput per hour, Dunkirk is 1,500 people per hour, right? Here's your challenge. Here's what these guys did. Historically unprecedented, just those three little stick figures. And these guys delivered 35 times that amount. Now, this, this is an interesting story of heroism for sure. Would you agree? <clears throat> uh, but when you get closer to the story, you realize it's a whole lot more than that. There were specific techniques these leaders had to go execute, and none of them had a single Agile, Lean, or PMP certification among them. <clears throat> <clears throat> so there's something intuitive about what they did were others who came before them on other rescue efforts, and some who came after, have not applied that made all the difference. So in order to describe this to you, I want to first give you a lay of the land here. <clears throat> this is Lower Manhattan on, on that day. <clears throat> For those of you who have been tourists in the area and been to the Statue of Liberty, that's just to give you some frame of reference there. I'm going to talk about Governor's Island in a minute. <clears throat> uh, just so you know, the Brooklyn waterfront, and then this is a major commuter hub. <clears throat> but before I go into it, I want to tell you a, a little bit of a personal story about what happened uh, where I was on that day. Uh, I, was, I, I live in D.C. I was, at, I was in the D.C. area. Uh, I had a project team at the Pentagon, which you may remember was also hit by a hijacked plane. Some client folks we knew uh, did perish that day. And I was scrambling around all morning trying to make sure my team was accounted for. And luckily, uh, they all emerged unscathed. But dur during that entire scramble, my mind kept going to New York. You see, I'm part of a large New York-based family. <clears throat> uh, especially at that time, I had quite a few family members who, who lived and worked in the city, uh, especially in Lower Manhattan. A particular concern to us all was my father and brother. My father had his, his most long-standing client at the 95th floor of the North Tower, which was the exact spot where the first plane hit. And my brother had been telling everyone how excited he was about a new client in Lower Manhattan as well. Now, we had no idea if they were actually there that day, but we also had no way to find out because uh, cell phones really weren't connecting calls, right? <clears throat> Luckily, we found out my brother was fine because we got an email from him that night saying, yeah, I was trapped in the dust and debris, holed up in a basement for hours, scrambling through the acrid air, finally finding my way to the water's edge, getting rescued, and then now I'm home emailing you all. And so, obviously, the first, the first uh, emotion was relief, right? But the, but the very next thought in my brain was, that was actually pretty fast. Right? So before I knew this story, it struck me just how fast these guys must have worked. I had no idea of the scale yet. But if his email from home after being mired in the dust and debris for hours was the first notification we got faster than cell phones, <clears throat> and I, I am a student of history, so I did know about Dunkirk, it was astonishing. And so that became a very powerful personal calling to me to maximize my own impact as a project leader. And very simply, that's why I'm here speaking to you all, to you all today. Okay, so <clears throat> how'd they do it? When in the video they called out for the boats, that was their biggest constraint, agreed? They had a small handful of boats under that Coast Guard's command, far from anything the British Navy had, right? <clears throat> they had no idea what their response would be. Obviously, you saw what it was. They anticipated it could be a good response. So they then examined where the second constraint was, which was the available space at the docks. And they realized if they got on the CB radio and directed all boats to the docks, that could be a disaster. Right? A natural uh, inclination, would you agree? But what a disaster that would have been. <clears throat> so they created a communications plan by reaching out to the boat captains. 
They planned and evaluated their options in spite of the, the obvious sense of urgency. Do you think you'd have that discipline? Right? How many times do we want to just skip planning and get right to the project? Right? But remember the part of the video where they said, please report to Governor's Island. Governor's Island, that little island off the tip of Manhattan, they created a staging area to keep the actual rescue lanes free from impediments. And these boat captains are thinking, I showed up to rescue people. You got me hanging out on the bench. Put me in, coach, right? <clears throat> they didn't dare. They were smart enough, right? So they planned with maximum impact in mind right from the get-go. Amazing, isn't it? This then teed up their ability to apply the second force multiplier. <clears throat> when they got a sense of the capacity at the piers, they roughly calculated how many boats that they could send and at what cadence to reach the piers, load up as many people as possible, and take them to their destinations. Think about that, to their destinations. They, they, they put bed sheets on boats saying, your destination is Brooklyn. You're going to just run the Brooklyn route, right? <clears throat> So they aligned capacity where, which, with where the constraint was, and then kept all the excess capacity in reserve. Common sense, but again, many of us don't have the, the, I guess, the discipline to do it always, do we? We feel the urgency to just throw resources at problems sometimes, right? So once they staggered their products according to where the capacity constraint was, and by the way, that capacity constraint was where they put it. They didn't take the hand that was dealt them and say, oops, we only have so many boats, right? They planned for what, where the constraint would be moved to because they were going to move it there. Talk about high impact. <clears throat> this then set up, set the stage for the next force multiplier, which is maximizing single task focus. Each boat captain had that one specific route with their bed sheet with the name of that destination, and they were told to go to that pier and run that route and get better and better and faster and faster, one task at a time, with no impediments. So you saw the video, that's what they did, right? <clears throat> Incredible. Those three then put together, set the stage for the fourth thing, which you hear a lot about at conferences, uh, like agile conferences, where agility is important and flexibility is important. Adjusting the plan, adjusting your execution to make sure it's delivering maximum impact, right? <clears throat> But to have these three force multipliers in place first really amplified it. They found that some boats worked better at some piers than others. Hard to know in advance, given the scenario, right? They found some boats had maintenance issues and had to be swapped out with another one thrown right in there. And they had the reserve capacity to do it. They found out <clears throat> that certain uh, areas were getting smoked out and people uh, didn't even know they were there, so there was no one waiting there. So they went to the piers that, that had people waiting, of course. <clears throat> they were adjusting constantly during execution with this impact in mind of the more people we can get, the faster we can get them. So remember the 1,500 people per hour versus 55,000 people per hour? <clears throat> they were adjusting to maximize that number every, everywhere they get, uh, every step they went, without violating any of the previous three. <clears throat> There were boats that ran out of fuel earlier than they thought, or the boat captains weren't monitoring fuel levels. Poof, right? They had extra capacity to go figure out how to help that along. They didn't have fueling stations, maintenance depots, but they had other resources they could dip into and reserve and, and conquer this. <clears throat> so look at what these four, again, common sense things that their intuition led them to delivered a 35 times impact over the previous historical pre uh, precedent. Isn't that amazing? Don't you think we can do that? We, we can do this. <clears throat> so for this presentation, I'm going to focus on these middle two, uh, not only, because, not only in, in the interest of time, but because I think a lot of us, I think, kind of get number one and number four a little bit more intuitively. We might even been trained in it more. Number two, numbers two and three seem hard to come by, I think. They seem like rare species in our organizations. I was speaking with a few of earlier today who were saying single tasking is a pipe dream, right? <clears throat> you know, have you seen my work environment, right? So let's spend a little bit of time on those to show their impact 
and how it might be relevant to your world, not just the world of sea lift rescues. Sound reasonable? Okay. So to give you a quick sample on the staggering, <clears throat> if you imagine that these, resource, these, these different colors are different resource types, and they're working multiple projects, as you can see there's three right here to keep it simple. <clears throat> uh, normally if they're trying to do three mostly simultaneously, it'll kind of run that pattern. Would you agree? Does this look familiar to how things are run in, in some of your project environments? More than three. Of course, of course more than three, right? <clears throat> I also like to make the point that this, uh, that you don't really get a whole week, do you, to focus on. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> but the concept I hope uh, you'll, you'll see, still see holds. If all you did without assuming any speed improvement is stagger according to your resource constraint, which in this case is what? Resource B, good, I heard a few. You can not only get those three projects done sooner, you can add a fourth. And you also get the learning from seeing that you have a constraint here that you now need to optimize around. It might have been more obvious in the sea lift rescue example, but take my word for it. When the Katrina rescue efforts happened, they forgot these lessons. And they threw resources at it, and they all ran into each other. Right? <clears throat> Okay, the, the second technique, by the way, you'll, for those of you who are interested in this topic uh, and, and you want to come to the workshop tomorrow, we will dive into a lot of this in more detail then. I want to make sure you at least had some concept for how it could be relevant in a work environment versus a sea lift rescue, okay? Okay, the other one I mentioned was single tasking. If you did a very simple game of the simplest tasks, which many of you in here I know have done, some of you maybe even with me, <clears throat> you'll see that the simplest of tasks if you do a task switching round in a game, which we'll also play tomorrow, and then a, a, a focused single tasking round, you see this speed improvement of almost double. <clears throat> and of course, we projects people also like this predictability part too, right? There's a more dramatic set of examples that I think knowledge workers like you at Intel, and for those of you who, who are not from Intel and are still here at this conference, you probably experience too. And that is, if this difference exists that huge on the simplest of tasks, requiring the least amount of focus, how big do you think the gap is on the most complex? I've actually begun measuring it with some of my clients, and it's a lot more than double. And I think you saw some evidence on the sea lift rescue too. <clears throat> I thought I'd leave you one more little hint, especially if you can't make the workshop tomorrow. An effective way to promote single tax and behavior. I think the Sea Lift Rescue <clears throat> guys in the Coast Guard would have appreciated something like this if they had the time to put it together. The, lean, the, the agile and lean worlds are starting to blend a bit and use more of these in tandem, <clears throat> of course. In fact, were, were there lean coffees yesterday? Yeah. That's so cool. <clears throat> uh, so it's, an, it's, it's nothing more than a glorified to-do list, but again, the, the simpler the better, right? This, is, this should be common sense. This should be... If not, if not immediately intuitive, it should at least tingle some bell in your ear that says there's, there's probably a way to do this. It's pretty simple. And so it's just to say, whatever this number is here, the open tasks, just make sure you have enough people to focus on them one at a time. <laughs> not so hard, right? <clears throat> in fact, I wish more Kanban board tools talked about it. Okay. Uh, just to give you another quick snapshot of what's possible in a large organization, just using that task board, nothing else. They didn't stagger, they didn't plan well, they didn't even adjust during execution very well, frankly. But they did this task board just to get single tasking down and see what that could do. <clears throat> and while they struggled, they had some issues, they improved pretty quickly and basically achieved a doubling in productivity all in just about two months. And again, I think the seal of rescue, we, we don't have a baseline to measure it against, but other than Dunkirk, but uh, pretty powerful stuff. Okay, how does this impact how many projects we can get done? <clears throat> Again, in the example, it was number of people rescued per hour. Well, what about we make this more relevant to our regular project environments, and we just say <clears throat> projects completed, right? Throughput of projects. So we had three projects, we got to four. I'm saying if you just did a few things to improve single tasking, I'm not talking about doubling speed. Still, still significant, but not as dramatic improvement there. And then you also added the task board as my enhanced 
discipline feature. <clears throat> and again, assumed a relatively modest, meaningful, but modest improvement. Look at the impact on the actual number of projects you can get done. We've more than tripled now. Starting to get a sense how this could work. <clears throat> so again, the projects is cool, but I thought I'd try and put it in impact terms because like rescuing human lives per hour is, is, sounds better than projects completed. Would you agree? Yeah. Uh, when I see that chart, I see like the world changing for the better, right? Um, <clears throat> and I see human, human lives saved, you know, and all sorts of great things. But let's at least quantify it. So let's take a simple example and imagine that you invest $100 million in a project portfolio, just to keep the math easy, okay? Easy enough? And let's imagine you do 100 projects per year. And let's say you expect some value in the order of $3 million on each one of these, however you might measure value. It doesn't have to all be financial, right? <clears throat> so call it impact if you don't like the word return. So $300 million return, <clears throat> $200 million net return, 200% ROI. Is my math good? Follow this? <clears throat> so imagine if you just doubled speed and got and put in staggering in, in the things that got us triple, and let's assume that triple. So we're going to invest the same amount, but now get 300 done. Okay? We're not assuming that each one's more valuable. Bam, 900 million, that sounds like a nice jump. <clears throat> and the ROI, therefore, is quadrupled. So the takeaway from this, if you don't like all the math, is a doubling in speed can deliver triple the projects, which can deliver quadruple the ROI, or impact. So when I talk about high-impact project leadership, I think of this. You double speed, you get quadruple impact. Isn't that cool? Okay, <clears throat> so now let's take this and apply it to some high-impact fields. If we want to really be high-impact, that's what we do, right? So I just threw these top 10, and I swear I picked these before I knew I was coming to Intel. <clears throat> I was even thinking of swapping them out, but I felt that would be dishonest. Uh, <clears throat> I spoke recently at the National Cancer Institute, so they were happy to see there was at least you know, something in there for them. Uh, how many of you in here, ra raise your hand if your top 10 list shares at least five of, uh, of these items as mine have. Your top 10 list has five of the same. Handful of you, okay. <clears throat> Whatever your top 10 might be, I want you to imagine the, the kind of impact you could have because if you think about it, we don't always feel super high impact, do we? I mean, think of the opportunity. Many of us in this room work in these fields. We're already in a position to make this incredible impact on humankind. My stretch goal. <clears throat> and yet, we too often run into issues. If your experience is anything like mine, you're, you're, you've seen project portfolios that over-politicize project selection, skip planning, throw resources at problems and create traffic jams, dilute focus <clears throat> by shifting priorities constantly, and reward being busy over delivering impact. It's not just me, right? Right? So, so and then the impact on us is as predictable as it is sad, right? <clears throat> when we do deliver high impact results, we aren't always heralded as heroes, are we? And even if we're not seeking heraldry, our quiet heroics come too often at the expense of major stress levels, significant overtime, uh, torn relations with our coworkers, our peers, our teams, sometimes loss of hair. Um, <clears throat> and of course, inevitably, that will have to impact your personal lives, stress your marriage, force you to miss important moments with your families and friends, <clears throat> force you to put hobbies on hold, dreams on hold, lives on hold. I've been there, and I suspect some of you have been there too. I suspect quite a few of you are there now. <clears throat> so let's review what we've learned. Whoops. 
go back. Ah. So, anyone disagree with this statement? So we now know this is a true statement, especially with that, that C-Lift video rescue. <clears throat> In addition, we know that many of the fields promising the greatest value to humankind <clears throat> are project-centric. Right? Right? And many of you here today work on those projects in those fields. Get the setup? <laughs> of course, unfortunately, there's this number three. The setup isn't there, really. We, we didn't come through on the punchline properly, did we? But with the techniques that we reviewed from our Coast Guard heroes, we can flip number three on its head, can't we? We can deliver a whole lot more in very, a whole lot more impact in very high impact fields without that personal cost. <clears throat> So let's do it, right? Let's do it. Okay. <clears throat> so for a little bit of help getting started, didn't want to just kind of wander off stage and wish you luck, right? <clears throat> uh, I mentioned the workshop tomorrow. Uh, some of you have become inaugural founding members of this club I helped found, uh, PPPL. Our first meeting is actually going to be this Friday. You have a chance to stamp your <clears throat> imprimatur on this. Uh, this is not for consultants like me. This is for internal change agent leaders like you. Okay? So, of course, I'm interested in helping you get there. <clears throat> uh, but this is a meeting for the leaders here who are sticking their necks out, trying to make this happen, and don't have enough of a connection on techniques like the ones you've seen today, other techniques that other smart people have to share, experiences overcoming obstacles, uh, especially if you feel kind of sometimes all alone in your own organizations trying to make it happen. <clears throat> There's not a lot of info on this initial website, but come see me or show up Friday and we'll tell you more. Oh, I apologize. We moved it, I think, from uh, that time shown there to 9 to noon. Uh, I was a little off. Your, your agenda has it correct. Okay? April, what room is it in? Is it one of the side rooms? Breakout. The breakout room? Okay. <clears throat> Uh, of course, there's some freebies here. Ooh, one of which is you all got this book, right? Uh, you have a sticker on that book, too, which offers an additional freebie, but you have to actually follow the link or the QR code to see what it is. I'm not going to tell you. <clears throat> and some other stuff there. So that is, that's cool. We still have a few minutes for questions, then. I'll be happy to take any. Great question. If you didn't hear it, the question was, how did the Coast Guard know to apply these techniques? Did they do any planning or drilling on this ahead of time? Is that right? <clears throat> uh, the short answer is, they did a lot of readiness drills ahead of time, but nothing with these techniques ahead of time. So it was all about leadership, organization, keeping cool under pressure, examining the situation, thinking it through critically, logically, before you act. Even under dire circumstances, pressuring you to act immediately. So they had that training. They didn't have any idea how to really drive up throughput. Think about it. What, how often do those projects happen? Right? <clears throat> you could argue they, could, they should train for it, perhaps today. Um, by the way, my dream is to get one of, those, one of those guys on stage with me. That'd be pretty cool to ask him that question. Other questions? Okay. Oh, one more. So the question was, what's the most common excuse for not doing single task focus? Uh, I don't know if I'd call it an excuse, but more like the biggest obstacle I'd say is, come on, you kidding me? You see how many things I have to juggle? Do you really have the discipline to turn off Outlook? You know, it's that, it's that sort of, it's just expected that you have to be uh, living in this culture of responsiveness as opposed to dr being maximum impact, right? <clears throat> I did have one, or t one last little slide, but I want to make sure we still have like three minutes if there's another question or two. All right, my last slide then. I want to know if I met my, oh, two more slides. We got back together. 
a few years later, <clears throat> alive and well, my dad and brother and me. So that was pretty cool to be back in New York with them, in much clearer air, of course. And my question to you, though, is how'd I do? <clears throat> I'm not, I, in fact, I almost don't want to know if you weren't inspired by the video, <laughs> right? <laughs> so I don't even ask for a show of hands right in there, but <clears throat> I am. We'll yeah, no prize. But <clears throat> now the stretch goal. I'm a little nervous about this one. So if you wouldn't mind, for those who actually think I at least came close to my stretch goal, please stand up. Is there, is there anyone standing? <laughs> A few, yay, all right. Well, fantastic, folks. Thank you so much. <clears throat>